happened in the past. And Charles was one of the, one of the handful, really, of, of, of uh, people working in economic history who was able to look back at previous uh, events in monetary and financial history and previous, uh, previous crises uh, and how uh, that, had been, uh, that had been handled. Charles is, uh, is here to talk about some of the issues in his book, uh, Fragile by Design, The Political Origins of Banking Crises and Scarce Credit. And the, the, I, think, I think it's right in saying the, the central question he's trying to uh, answer in that book is um, how in an ideal world uh, can we have a banking system that delivers abundant credit, plenty of credit that enables economic growth and avoids having, uh, having frequent uh, financial crises. And it turns out that if you look back at history, it's a very hard thing to, uh, to achieve that. So we're delighted to, uh, that you could join us here today, Charles. Uh, and let me um, hand over to you, and please join me in welcoming him. It's a great pleasure to be here today, and uh, very encouraging to see such a large audience to talk about banking. Uh, listening to Ramesh talk about... Uh, how lucky he was in that the crisis happened. Uh, I'm thinking, I, I guess that's a, a similar uh, experience that I'm having. Uh, the crisis has certainly created a lot more interest in banking. But it wasn't just one event. Uh, actually, we're living in the middle of what I would describe as a pandemic of banking crises around the world for the past 35 years or so. Only about 29% of countries around the world have managed to avoid a major banking crisis during that time, and some have had more than one. Uh, the United States, for example, has had two major crises during that period. I want to emphasize that that's quite unusual. I'll come back to talk about that, uh, the frequency, the increased frequency and severity of banking crises as an interesting fact that begs a question that we have to address. So why are these banking crises happening? Uh, the standard view among economists is two things. First, banks are inherently fragile. Uh, they hold on their asset side opaque assets, assets that can be hard for outsiders to value, and they, on, they finance those assets acquisition with short-term liabilities. And if there is a big shock that happens, that big shock about, uh, that can raise questions about the value of those assets leads people to be concerned that banks might not be able to meet their payments. They might withdraw the debts from the banks. In anticipation of that, the banks themselves might decide to stop lending and start trying to accumulate cash. So you get the picture. The story, basically, of banking crises, in most people's minds, combines these two things. The presence of a big shock, some kind of uh, economic uh, uh, influence that's exogenous, that is not the result of the banking system itself, but the result of, oh, let's say, bad weather, crop failures, whatever you want to think of, and combined with the inherent fragility of banks. Now, the problem with this is that it's it's not going to be a sufficient answer to the question. And the reason it isn't a sufficient answer is because the frequency of banking crises differs uh, across time and across space. And in fact, as I just mentioned, we're currently living through a pandemic of banking crises. But other times, let's take, for example, the period 1970, oops, the period 1974 1874 to 1913, I meant to say, um, is one in which the inherent sort of volatility of the GDP uh, uh, in the world was actually greater than it is today. And yet, during that time, we had very few banking crises. So if in the recent period, we've had more than 100 nations have experienced, more than 100 uh, major banking crises have ex been experienced across the world, uh, during this prior period, really only about a dozen. Six insolvency crises and six sort of liquidity crises, all of which were, by the way, the, li the liquidity crises in the United States. So it can't really be that big shocks combined with the inherent nature of banks explain crises because 
They're so much more common today. Furthermore, some countries, even when they experience very big shocks, and even though they may have very uh, uh, lively banking systems, that is, banking systems that are providing a very large amount of credit, may be able to avoid crises, while others that are providing similar amounts of credit, or maybe even less amounts of credit on average over time, might experience much more. And the, the comparison that I've got here to describe today is between Canada and the United States. So Canada is a country that experienced zero banking crises from the beginning of its, uh, the origins of its banking system till today. The US has experienced 17. Yet the Canadian banking system has actually produced more credit on average relative to GDP than the US has during that period. Canada, of course, is a primary commodity exporting economy, and its GDP has been much more volatile over time than the US. So what's the other missing element in the story that can explain this frequency and severity of banking crises in some countries relative to others? Is it regulation? And I would say, yes, there's a lot of economic evidence that different countries and at different times, the same country, changes in regu regulation have mattered a lot for making the banking system relatively fragile. The most important regulatory uh, change has been the tendency to protect banks. The more banks are protected with deposit insurance or other kinds of uh, bailout policies, the more they seem to get into trouble. Uh, that is not a hard to figure out sort of uh, effect. Um, if you're protected, then you feel that you can take a little bit more risk. And that seems to be a very powerful story. And it's the combination of protection with inadequate prudential regulation. When, that's, when those two things are combined, they do seem to account for uh, some of the difference over time and across countries that's observed. But then that just begs another question, which is, well, why do some countries seem to consistently um, combine protection with inadequate regulation, while other countries seem to be able to um, avoid the problem? And so we're, our answer is that if you're looking for the, the reason behind regulatory differences in countries, you have to look at the politics. That's where regulation comes from. And so this book is an attempt to try to systematically study how politics has shaped banking regulation. And we look in particular at the histories of five countries, the UK, the US, Canada, Mexico, and Brazil. Um, over the last more than 300 years, we start at the beginning of their histories of banking, modern banking, and uh, trace the way politics has evolved and the way those changes and differences across countries in time in, in politics mattered for banking system outcomes. I, if I were going to give you the key insight of the uh, the book with respect to fragility, it would be this, that when the political environment is such that it's easy for political groups to form, coalitions of different people to form, to find a way to use the banking system regulation as a means to channel resources from some groups in the population to others. That is, to find a way to, some factions find a way to make the banking system favor them at the expense of others, that that seems to be the sort of underlying common denominator of banking systems that are dysfunctional. That is, both that, that tend to provide less credit and tend to be more unstable. Banking systems can be particularly attractive as these kinds of tax and transfer devices because it can often be very hard for people to see exactly how, unlike on budget government expenditure, it can be very hard to see exactly who's being favored and who's being taxed. That is, who's being disadvantaged and who's being advantaged by the, the system. We call the political process of bargaining, 
and the, these formations of coalitions that control banking system outcomes. We call that the game of bank bargains. Now, the way that game is played varies, of course, across different countries, especially it's very different within democracies than it is within autocracies. But that's, uh, no matter how different the game is played, that's the common denominator of problems. What about credit scarcity? The strange thing is that even though the basics of commercial banking were all in place by the middle of the 18th century, most of which having been invented in Scotland prior to that time, and I think we, we would agree that they're not rocket science, nevertheless, most countries in the world still have not managed to imitate them. That is, we still are in a world characterized by scarce credit, by a scarcity of basic commercial banking practice. And we point out that that, is, that deficiency in banking is explained similarly by political factors. So that this gives you a little bit of a sense of the ratio of private credit to GDP and how much it varies across countries. You can see the five subject countries in the book have the uh, darkened black vertical lines, the UK, Canada, the US, Brazil, and Mexico, and then the rest of the countries in the World Bank's database. But you can see the enormous variation in the ratio of credit to GDP with a country like the UK at about you know, one and a half times GDP in private credit, whereas a country like uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo with essentially zero credit relative to GDP. Now, I, some of you laughed and you probably thought, well, they're not surprised that countries that are so uh, war-torn and uh, having extreme governance problems are going to have a hard time constructing a banking system. And I think that's exactly right. But the thing is that one has to generalize a bit from that and understand that it's more generally the case that political uh, problems or political deficiencies are at the very heart of banking system problems and banking system deficiencies. So what we do in the book is we take very seriously the idea that banking system design reflects implicit partnerships between governments and private actors. And we take very seriously the way that this uh, game of bank bargains is organized. Um, we try to understand it. It certainly is, is a uh, fundamental in the sense that it is what d determines entry into banking, who gets to be a banker, uh, what the banks get to do, how competitive the banking system will be, who is going to be, have favored access to credit, and when losses occur, how are those losses going to be allocated? Governments often choose what we could describe as bad rules of this game, that is, rules that produce inefficient outcomes, inadequate credit, unstable credit. But they do so not because they're trying to create problems per se, but because the interests of the groups that are in charge are actually served by creating systems that are unstable and that provide inadequate credit on, in, to the rest of the population. These are some countries not uh, with the exception of Canada, that are not in our, our database, uh, I'm sorry, not in our uh, group of five countries that we're going to study in depth, but they are in the broader World Bank database. Um, and what they have in common is that they are the six countries that have managed to have fairly abundant credit and avoid crises for the past 40 years. What they have in common uh, is that they are either, in the top three countries, city or island states, what do city or island states have in common? They tend to be places where it's very hard to create wedges within the population. So a lot, for example, in the US's history, a lot of the division in these um, coalition formations that have occurred is between urban and rural groups. Um, it's not something you're going to see in an island or city state. So the first thing to notice is those, the first group are those are countries that are small and politically homogeneous, 
that we think is, is a good explanation for why they've managed to sustain abundant credit without crises. The last three, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, especially Canada and New Zealand, are countries that have a tradition of anti-populist constitutions. That is, constitutions that make it very hard for factions to form to control the outcome in the banking system at the expense of others, at the expense of the broader economy. So our, our conclusions end up being at the level of successful banking systems having a lot to do with successful constitutions. Where do those successful constitutions come from is yet another question, and I'll, I'll try to give a hint or two about that before my time runs out. But before I move on to that, of course, on the other side of the coin, countries that have very scarce credit and very high frequency of crises are listed here. Um, there's a list of the two, the, a category of especially high crisis propensity and especially low credit, which is just Chad and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But then if you make a slightly larger, more sort of forgiving definition of, of those two things, you get a larger list, but you can see these are countries that are mainly autocracies and also countries that tend to be uh, those that have had a history of poor governance problems. But what about the United States? Why is the United States in the list of countries that has had two major crises recently and 17 over its history? And that brings us to, to this point, which is, while it's true that de democracies tend to do better than autocracies on average, being a democracy is not per se a solution, solution to endemic banking crises because some democracies have constitutions that have been much more permissive of the formation of factions that get control of the banking system to produce unstable outcomes at the expense of the general economic good. I've already mentioned that. This gives you a sense of the difference between ca Canadian and U.S. credit relative to GDP. You can see that Canada um, and the U.S. Tr have tracked each other pretty closely, but not in the recent period. Can Canada has managed to um, outstrip the U.S., so both in terms of stability and in terms of credit access in the banking system. These are a list of questions that we address in, in the book. What's producing these country differences? Why are democracies generally doing better? Why do some democracies do better than others? And through what mechanisms, how do these political coalitions actually form and produce these outcomes in bank regulation? So we trace that process, and obviously, in a short lunch talk, I'm not going to be able to give you much of the flavor of that, but I'm going to give you a little bit of the flavor of it by emphasizing um, that there's really no way to avoid politics in banking. Um, for people to participate in banking as sources of funding uh, supply for banks, whether they're um, majority shareholders, minority shareholders, or depositors, they have to come to grips with, they have to feel confident about these three different problems that they might face that might lead them to lose their money, to have their money expropriated. Their money could be expropriated um, by the government. In autocracies, this is quite frequent. Depositors and minority shareholders find that their money could be expropriated by the management of the bank, who tend to be the majority uh, shareholder in many, country, many countries. Or majority shareholders, depositors, and minority shareholders could find that they're expropriated by debtors. That happens in populist democracies, where uh, people who borrowed from the bank who can't repay their loans go, you know, go to the political process to try to get um, to appeal for protection so that they don't have to repay, of course, at the expense of those who funded the bank. And so if you're giving money to a bank, you're very concerned about all of these potential risks. And of course, the way that those get uh, resolved is either the risks are mitigated or you have to be compensated for bearing those risks. The government, of course, is in charge of setting the rules that deal with each of those risks, but the government is an inherited, inherently conflicted party. It simultaneously borrows from banks and regulates them. 
It enforces debt contracts, but it needs the political support of the debtors. It distributes losses, but it also needs the political support of depositors. So you get the idea that the, there's just no way of getting politics out of the banking system. And those participation constraints, the fact that you need to attract people to the banking system, but the inherent risks that have a political sort of origin are going to be at the heart of our explanation of bank fragility. This is, gives you a sense in the, in the book of our attempt to try to map from on the left of this diagram various kinds of uh, political regimes to thinking toward the right of the diagram about various kinds of banking system outcomes and the kinds of performance and deficiencies that you get in the banking system that tend to be uh, resulting from the particular kinds of political environments. So we've tried to figure out how the game of bank bargains is played in these different political regimes and then try to explain how that logic of bargaining tends to produce predictable deficiencies in outcomes. I'm down to the last four or five minutes, so I want to go very quickly at this point. Um, here are the five countries that we study. I'm only going to talk briefly about the first three, which are the de democracies in the sample. Um, this gives you a brief sketch of the histories of each of them, but I'm going to skip that. Um, one thing, as long as we're here in, in uh, London, talk a little bit about the early differences between England and Scotland. So, as, as I said before, most of what's interesting about commercial banking was invented in Scotland uh, in the early, by the middle of the 18th century. In contrast, and the Scottish banking system was an extremely financially uh, sort of abundant environment and also a very stable one. In contrast to England and Wales, the key difference being that England and Wales had a single bank that was chartered, namely the Bank of England, and then limited size bank partnerships that were allowed to operate. From 1694 till 1826, there were no other chartered banks in England and Wales, while Scotland had numerous chartered banks and um, operating with branch networks uh, quite successfully. That's a little strange because they had the same sovereign. They were operating here on the same island, and yet they had two completely different banking systems. And the essential answer to that that we say is war. That is, the Bank of England served the purpose, and English banking uh, served the purpose, of financing the sovereign's war needs. That is, there was a very large amount of crowding out. The reason why private credit wasn't allowed to flourish in England and Wales was because credit was needed for the sovereign's war financing. Scotland was permitted to avoid that burden and to develop very differently. After the end of the Napoleonic Wars, which brought that long period of war with France to an end, that was the beginning of the discussions that led to the liberalization, first in 1826, then in 1833, and subsequently. And by the uh, 1840s, basically, the banking systems of Scotland and England are starting to look quite similar. But you could never understand why those banking systems were so different for so long if you didn't understand what we call the iron law of credit supply, which is there's only a chance that banks will provide credit to the private sector after the survival of the state has been insured. And so the survival of the state, after all, the state's in control of banking. It's not going to produce a banking system set of rules that are inconsistent with its own survival. And so that's a, one example of the principles that guide the game of bank bargains. I'm going to skip through this except to point out to you, the, and if you thought that Britain had a very robust banking system throughout its history, you were wrong. Uh, from about World War I until through the 1970s, the British banking system was moribund. And in fact, you can see here that the German banking system, in terms of credit relative to GDP, was far in excess of the British. But look what happened during the Big Bang in the mid-1980s. Within five years, the 
credit to GDP ratio in the UK tripled, and then over subsequent years, it doubled again. So that the current uh, status of London as a world financial center and the abundance of credit that Britain enjoys today is actually a fairly recent phenomenon um, that was not true for most of the 20th century. I'm going to uh, just end the story quickly here because I know I'm, I'm a bit over time. Um, on the United States is the quintessential populist banking story, uh, very unstable banking, and the key sort of uh, problem has been that the banking system has been used to achieve um, favored outcomes for particular subsets of the population. A very important message here is I know that we like to blame bankers for just about everything, but bankers can't do it by themselves. They can't create this kind of trouble all on their own. During the period from about 1820 until 1980, it was an alliance of rural populist landowners and small unit bankers that were the main sort of stable alliance, political alliance in the United States that gave us a disastrous banking system, a banking system of tens of thousands of banks, none of which was allowed to branch, none of which could operate, that is, except one office in one location. What was the point of, of having a banking system like that? Well, it did give local monopoly power to banks because it was very hard for competition to happen locally in an environment that was structured that way. But it also benefited uh, rural landowners because they had banks that they felt were fairly closely tied to their particular economic interests. That is, the bankers, because they were local, didn't have as many options to lend outside of their local economy. As the population shifted and as a, the banking crisis of the 1980s created large costs for the resolution of banks, um, government policy finally shifted toward a banking system like that of every other country in the world, nationwide branch banking. But now you had a new opportunity, which was to determine who would be able to run those new nationwide branch banks that were being formed in the 1980s and the 1990s. And that created um, an opportunity for urban activist groups, a new kind of populism, no longer the rural populism of the prior era, but now an urban populism. And those groups were able to effectively use the political process to require that banks engaged in mergers had to pay urban activist groups very large sums of money in order to win per political permission to engage in those mergers. You can see very few uh, branches in the historic period. This is in 1920. You can see a big consolidation wave happening here in the US. Um, this gives you a little bit uh, of a sense. $867 billion was um, committed contractually to get the support of urban activist groups at merger hearings to favor the creation of these mega banks. And the mega banks were created, of course, to, to make money. They weren't going to give uh, wonderful contracts to urban activist gr groups uh, if they, if they uh, didn't have some way of paying for those. And so the deal, of course, was if you're willing to make these kinds of loans, you're going to get some privileges in exchange, and the privileges that the banks and the so-called GSEs, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac got, had to do with, these are some mandates uh, relating to uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's acquisition of very risky debts too. But the privileges basically were that if you were willing to make these loans, then you would also be uh, able to hold very thin equity capital ratios, very little in, in terms of loss absorption capacity alongside those loans. In other words, the political bargain was, let's create a lot of risky assets and let's simultaneously have very little in capital buffers to absorb losses for those assets. The, economically, that's completely illogical. Politically, that makes perfect sense because otherwise you wouldn't have gotten such a great bargain between those two groups. Canada avoided this, and I, I'll leave you, that to uh, further discussion, 
But Canada avoided this because it managed to set up a constitutional system that throughout this whole period that we we're describing of US sort of fragility, managed to resist populist pressures to use the banking system as a tool for extracting resources for these particular factions. And I will uh, end with this last slide, giving you some basic conclusions and uh, open it up for further comments. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Charles, for a, uh, a romp through what is, what is a very big book and a lot of, lot of material, a lot of countries, a lot of history. Um, I'm going to open up to questions in a moment, but I'm going to start off by uh, taking the chair's prerogative of putting, up, putting a couple of questions of my own, if I may. Uh, let's start with the, with the, the US, Charles. Um, as I understand it, all American children are taught that the American Constitution is the finest uh, political institution ever created in the whole of history. And yet, presumably, that must be... And I mean, it's, it's also almost impossible to change. You know, you can't, you can't introduce gun control. It's very hard to get an amendment through the, uh, through the Congress. If, if, if that, that is the case, it seems to me what you're saying is that actually that's really at the heart of the political processes that make banking crises endemic to American society. Yes, that's true. That's a good question. I don't know how to improve <laughs> upon it. Uh, I would also point especially to... When you, when you were saying... It can be very hard to get things through the sort of formal budgeting process. And that's why the banking system is particularly useful, because it doesn't require, uh, remember, it was mainly done at the state level. So it didn't require all of this apparatus to come together. Uh, the reason that, that um, the banking system originally was structured the way it was had to do with state laws and with the impossibility of creating a national system, despite the fact that Alexander Hamilton envisioned it that way, it didn't come through that way. So yes, I do think that it's a constitutional problem. Um, when I sometimes give this talk in the United States, people say to me, why can't we be like Canada? And I say, well, first of all, how many of you would like the uh, Queen of England to appoint the members of the Senate? And I don't tend to see a lot of hands going up. <laughs> So you didn't really have a chance to get into it, what, but why is, is uh, Canada so different? What, what is it in, in, in their political process that, that's so different from the US? Well, they, it was, the thing about Canada is, I think we all sort of, you know, we start our chapter on Canada sort of joking that everybody makes fun of the Canadians for being so dull. Um, they do it in this country, they do it in the United States as well. Worthwhile Canadian initiative kind of thing. But, but you know, Canada is not an exogenously dull place. It's an endogenously dull place. In other words, Canada is dull by design. Actually, Canada was a little bit too lively. Remember that when uh, the Battle of Quebec resulted in Britain taking control of Canada, it was a country that was full of people who hated Britain, called French. <laughs> and uh, they, the, the challenge really was all along how to govern a country create an, enough democracy so that you could get uh, the royalists leaving the United States to migrate into uh, Ontario and also get Brits to migrate there so that you could develop Canada. And notice what a challenge it was because it was laid out on a horizontal geography so that if the Quebecs didn't want to uh, allow canals to be built, you couldn't really access the St. Lawrence and you couldn't really have Canada develop. And so it required extreme, the solution that they finally hit upon after making some mistakes along the way, the, the British government didn't get it right initially. Pitt's initial vision for Canada uh, was actually not right. But by the 1840s, after an uprising, the French up, uh, had an uprising in 1837, they figured out finally that it made sense to dilute the French population's influence by creating voting rules that would do that. So the whole idea of Canada was to create a constitution that would be democratic, but that would limit factions from being able to block things that were in the greater national interest. And so the Canadian constitution is the antithesis of the US constitution in the centralization of power over economic decisions in the national government, and also uh, its Senate, which really was, uh, you know, both the US Senate and the Canadian Senate in some sense were modeled a, a bit on the idea of the House of Lords, but 
uh, it been, in 1911, the House of Lords loses its real authority here in the UK. And the Canadian Senate, Senate still has its authority to block money legislation. And the same populist uprisings that, that were happening in Canada, I'm sorry, in the United States, that were affecting bank regulation issues were happening simultaneously in Canada too. The difference was they weren't succeeding. The reason they weren't succeeding was the structure of the Canadian Constitution, and in particular, the Canadian Senate. So often you'll see things get so far in Canada and then they get defeated in the Senate. And that, I think, is a very instructive point. So it was both the centralization, unlike the US where it was determined at the state level, that was one element, but then it was also the fact that the Senate had uh, the ability to block these kinds of things. And it was similar things in Australia and New Zealand? That, New they're, Zealand, they're, they're in your yeah. So the, the high achieving group as well, aren't they? Australia is a little different, um, but New Zealand is interesting because uh, we only talk about these, those other countries very uh, perfunctorily, but in New Zealand, the role of the French is played by the Maori. So it's, it's a, you, you, you want to create uh, a liberal, classical liberal democracy, um, because if you created a populist democracy, you wouldn't be able to control uh, the economic policies and so that, that same sort of history, can, in that sense, Canada and New Zealand have a sort of similar history. Now let's, let's cross the Atlantic and, and come to, to Britain. And you mentioned England versus uh, Scotland, which is a, a very hot topic at the moment. Um, give, 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 us, give us your perspective on what, what we can learn, learn from that past history of the differences between the banking system and the kind of thing that you're presumably coming into here in the UK, the big, uh, exactly. the big debate I'm, over Scottish independence. I, I, I certainly don't want to get uh, on the wrong side of somebody on that debate, but... Uh, I would note that the, the Union Act in 1707 was in a sense an act of unilateral political disarmament that was from the perspective of the economic achievement that, that followed it seemed to be a very wise one. That is, in 1705, um, John Law wrote a treatise about trying to get banking started in Scotland, uh, a Scottish land bank, that was uh, very instructive because he talked about how primitive and how poor Scotland was at that time. But within a few decades from that moment, Scotland was actually thriving. And from the standpoint of banking system and credit and overall sort of commercial activity, it was doing quite well. And the, the view that we take of that is that Scotland kind of recognized, or, or the, the decision to get rid of the Scottish Parliament at that point was um, a recognition that by disarming politically, that it could live in a kind of benign laissez-faire relationship with respect to England. And that, that worked very well, I think. While the English were busy having to bear all the burdens of financing the wars against the French from 1688 until 1815, the Scots banking system was relieved of all those burdens. Let's, let's move to a, a part of the world that you, you haven't really focused on much in, in the book, but it's interesting to see what your take is, is, is continental Europe and the, and the, the Eurozone in particular. I mean, as you know, the, the European banks are still pretty much in a, in a crisis situation yes. uh, since 2007. And there, there's all sorts of talk about how you manage bank regulation across a number of different sovereign states. What, what does your analysis, your approach to understanding these things uh, ref reflect on that? Well, it's... it's uh the, the, the Eurozone has certainly complicated the politics of banking. So, for example, um, I think it would be fair to say that the, a, a particular country, let's say France's uh, willingness to recognize and resolve problems in its banking system, might be reduced by the presence of the Eurozone and the EU because they might... Uh, if it were just up to them, and if they weren't part of a broader union, they might face stronger incentives to do something quicker. But the possibility of creating a transfer, effectively, of some of those costs to Germany, I think has created a bit of a temptation to delay uh, dealing with problems. So I think that this is um, an, one element of a longer story, which is that actually the EU and the Eurozone has because of the, the difficulty of political coordination of dealing with these, these, resolving these problems, 
has probably delayed the uh, effective responses to them. And the banking union that's recently been announced, do you, do you, do you see that as, uh, how do you see that sitting in with the, with the politics across the different states? Well, it's, I think, uh, uh, by the way, I did resign from the uh, advisory scientific committee of the European Systemic Oh, so you Risk can speak freely then? Two, two months ago. <laughs> so I've served on it for two years. Um, and, you know, we, we recommended, and of course it was simple, it was obvious, that if you're going to have, uh, it makes sense to have consolidated supervision, that is centralized supervision. It makes sense, but if you're going to have centralized supervision, you have to be able to have intervention. Meaning, if the supervisor says that the bank is lying, or that the uh, capital is, is inadequate, that the supervisor can actually do something to force the bank to either come up with that, or to uh, close down the bank, or to have an infusion of government funds into the bank, or something. We call that resolution. So if you're going to be a supervisor, you have to have resolution authority. But if you're going to have resolution authority, you, you also need to have some physical resources. And you have, need to have legal authority. Uh, unfortunately, the ECB doesn't have any of that. It doesn't have clear legal resolution authority, and it doesn't have fiscal resources. So right now, the ECB is going to be doing a stress test this year for the European banks. But if you work backwards from the politics, there's no way that the ECB will play the game of political chicken of actually calling out all of the problems in the banking system that it's going to see. And so I will predict that the stress test will deliver a number, ultimately, that will be about 50 to 100 billion euros of capital deficiency, of, of needed increase in capital, when the true number might be upwards of four or 500 billion. Thank you, Charles. Well, let's, let's open the, uh, the um, question out to, the, out to the floor now. Who has a question? If you could uh, wait, just wait for the microphone to come to you and introduce yourself and your affiliation and uh, put your question to Charles. Uh, Jared Buckley, fellow. Uh, could you comment on the Chinese banking system and how you see it evolving? Well, it's an autocratic uh, country banking system. Uh, the banking system still, uh, the official banking system, still main, major uh, function is to support state-owned enterprises. And uh, the banking system is a loss-making machine that, uh, you know, roughly not quite half of Chinese GDP it goes into investment, and still the state-owned enterprises, let's say, are about half of that amount is their investment. And so that's a very large amount of investment that's not very profitable, in fact, unprofitable and value-destroying, which is the responsibility of the banks to finance. So the banks are therefore creating losses every year predictably. The good news is that the Chinese government has trillions worth of hard currency reserves with which to, to infuse into the banking system. It, the last time it did it officially was back in 1999, 2000, but it's going to have to do that again. So the banking system is trapped in China by it, the fact that it plays a crucial role for the Communist Party. And it's a great illustration of the way that uh, the political reality constrains the ability to, you know, the Chinese government has been saying now for over a decade that it wants to have major banking system reforms and liberalization. But the basic political reality of needing to control the banking system and, and, liber and, and limit liberalization in order to make the fiscal costs of that transfer I was describing relatively uh, affordable for the government that's what's limiting reform in the banking system, and it will continue to limit it. And then, of course, what you have growing up alongside the banking system is the shadow banking system, which is a source, potentially, of uh, different kinds of instability. Yes, good question here. Uh, Nadia Crandall, um, Harvard Business School Angels, London. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you about the US banking system uh, where the government and the and the Federal Reserve seem to have engaged seem to be engaging in a in a in a, a devil's pact where the poor are being increasingly disenfranchised in favor of of the wealthy in the US um, the uh, financial repression that's going on uh, and the uh, QE process of QE which has looks infinite now because it, it's becoming increasingly difficult to limit that kind of infusion of capital into the system. At the same time, that money velocity has fallen to multi-decade lows, so it's in, a, in an ineffective process. I just wonder how that plays out. I, I don't see 
a clear exit? Well, um, I'm, I'm going to jump to the conclusion that when you were talking about the Federal Reserve and the distributional effects of that, you're worried about the fact that, that it's keeping interest rates very, very low. Is that, is that part of your, the concern? One of my main yes, concerns. right. So I'm worried about um, the inflationary risks longer term or medium term that are coming from QE potentially. Um, the, the interesting thing about the exit from QE is that from a purely economic perspective, the exit is not a problem. The Fed can decide to uh, shrink its balance sheet at any time uh, as that inflation risk and, uh, starts to, uh, to grow. The, so what we, what we worry about is not that the Fed can't shrink its balance sheet, but that for political reasons it might decide not to. So let me give you an example. The Fed is currently holding vast quantities of long-term treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities long-term on its balance sheet. Once, um, suppose that people start to anticipate that the Fed is going to, uh, that inflation's going up and that the Fed's going to have to raise interest rates. That means that interest rates start rising, long-term interest rates rise immediately. That means that there are huge losses if the Fed goes to sell any of those securities. Those losses would make the Fed insolvent on a, book on a book basis. That's irrelevant. It's a central bank. It prints money. It, it doesn't matter that it's insolvent. But politically, the Fed insolvency would be very hard for the Fed to defend. There would be people in Congress who would find that very objectionable. And so one of the, the key political constraints on uh, unwinding the Fed's expansionary policies is that it may decide, based on a political calculation, not to sell mortgage-backed securities and treasury bonds as quickly as it needs to, because if it did, it would make itself politically open, sort of open season for attack on the Fed. So when uh, thinking about monetary policy, you come right back to some of these same issues, which is that the Fed is itself a political animal in Washington. And so I, I think the biggest risks we have to inflation have to do with the game that's being played politically between the Fed and the Congress. We've got a question over here. Uh, why don't we take this question and this question, and, uh, and Charles can respond to, to both. Thank you. Jeremy Kaplan, Fellow of the Royal Society. Um, earlier, you mentioned that effectively banks were being protected from risk. Mm -hmm. And the way we see it as the average Joe public is that effectively public money is being sucked out and going into the private sector. Is there not some form of trackability and traceability of where that money is going? And if there is, by definition, because it doesn't just disappear into the ether, what would be your advice as the best way of effect effectively, um, call it taxing or putting some, some payment at the end of that process that would inhibit the flight of money from public through into private? Mm -hmm. Thanks, we'll take this question here. Yeah, hi, Sean Glasgow from uh, Ostinato. I, I don't remember my dates exactly, but you, the, not a crisis in between 1874 and 1913, so I'm assuming 1873 there was or something. And uh, I think that was around the time that Mark Twain was writing, mm -hmm. and he was through a financial crisis and lots of sarcasm about the establishment, fat cats and all that type of thing. Uh, I guess with this whole thing here, there's a lot of high-paid professional elite. Is there something that's not happening there that these games sh should not be, be, be played? So anything that you can, can possibly uh, talk about there? Thanks. Well, those, those were coincidentally kind of related questions. Um, I'm going to try to address them, but they're very complicated questions. So the, the, let me start with the first one. Uh, one of the good things that's happened in the United States uh, recently is we passed legislation that requires an honest accounting of credit subsidization from the taxpayer so that when, um, for example, the, the TARP program w was uh, enacted, the um, investments have to be understood. Any kind of subsidy that's received has to be understood as um, a very risky investment. 
what that means is that, for example, right now, um, Fannie Mae is about to repay uh, the amount of, of resources that, that were injected into it in its uh, recent dividend payments will now have topped up equal, an, an amount equal to the amount of injections that went into them. And so some people in the press are saying, there, they've paid the money back. But we've, as economists, that's not how we think about it. And so we do have, I don't want to get into too much of the details, but the point is that when you give assistance in, in a crisis to a very risky entity, um, the implied return that you need to expect is not zero, and it's not the risk-free interest rate. It's actually a fairly high return. So that what it would mean to make taxpayers whole coming from the assistance that Fannie Mae received is nothing like re receiving back an equal amount of cash. It's got to be receiving back much more. So the good news is, in the United States, we've created, at least in principle, legislation that's made clear that the economic principle of risk and reward has to be codified. So I think that the first part is a transparent and credible economic accounting is absolutely key. Um, I'm, I'm not going to really be able to satisfactorily address your question, except to say that I, I do think that uh, the nature of the, of the personalities in banking tend to be, of course, quite colorful, like in politics. They are both intermediaries of these kinds of problems. Politicians and bankers, politicians are intermediaries of power. Bankers are intermediaries of money. And the two tend to be working together. But they're just intermediaries. As colorful as they are and as strange as they sometimes appear, they're simply reflecting powers that are occurring beneath them. And so the, it's not just the bankers and the politicians. What I would say is that often, the harder thing for us to do as citizens of these democracies is to look ourselves in the mirror. The Help to Buy program in the UK, which I view as a very risky and a very unwise program, exists because it has political appeal. So you can, you can blame a politician for that, or you can say that politician is a very astute intermediary of your own preferences as a population. And we'll find out if he's right in the election. <laughs> yeah, we've got a question over here. Uh, and then if we just pass it to behind you on when you're done. Uh, Victor Hill, I'm a fellow here. I was going to ask you about Bill Clinton, who, amongst other things, abolished Glass-Steagall. Um, but actually, coming closer to home, I'd like to ask you about Gordon Brown. If you were he, if you were prime minister in... 2008, would you have spent 60 billion of taxpayers' money to bail out the Royal Bank of Scotland, or would you just have liquidated it and walked away? <laughs> hold, hold on a second. We've got, we've, we've, I'll, I'll let you have a think about that. <laughs> Let's get just, pass it just, uh, just behind, there's a lady there who wants to, has a question. Hi, uh, I'm Alicia. I'm an A level student. And could you please comment on the banking system of Japan? Okay. So um, let me start with the first one. I think that it's very hard to liquidate um, especially huge global powerhouses in today's world, and especially so really in a democracy, because liquidate at whose expense, too, is, a, is an important question to ask. Um, because when you liquidate, that means that maybe depositors aren't going to be fully paid off. And then are you willing and able in a democracy to actually impose losses on depositors? So it's a, a very, uh, these are very tricky questions. Um, it's certainly the case that the protection of banks, which has now become uh, especially severe for very large banks, the so-called too big to fail problem, is, uh, is, is something very hard to walk away from politically. It, it would. Allowing those banks to fail would have economic consequences, but they'd also have very difficult to manage political consequences. And not just for bankers, but also for depositors. And we've, we've come to a point in most developed economies where we're not willing to tolerate depositors losing any money. Again, like that help to buy program, it's an issue of looking in the mirror ourselves to ask how would we feel about tolerating depositors' losses. 
And so I do think that, again, the politicians make decisions predictably. So I, I can't answer your question directly except to say that in all of my regulatory proposals designed, I try to keep very large banks from being far away from an insolvency threshold do I, so I don't have to answer those questions in the future. <laughs> um, now talking of, and the way you can do that is making them have to maintain on their own dime through very large capital requirements uh, have to absorb their own losses. And I think that's really the key, how we design those capital requirements to do that. Um, and that's not a free launch either because higher capital requirements will tend to be associated with lower credit growth. So it, it, there's no easy way out of the problems that we have. With respect to Japan, of course, J Japan was a, is a unique banking system. In the 1990s, they managed to go for a whole decade or more with um, bank, you know, massive insolvencies that went unresolved and which were perceived, I think, correctly as creating a long-term sort of drag on economic growth through an inability to respond with increasing credit. Um, and that problem was resolved finally with effectively at the, at the expense of taxpayers in Japan. Um, I'm not an expert on the current health of the Japanese banking system except to say that I think it's reasonably good. But that my sense is that despite all of the reforms in corporate governance in Japan that happened in the 2000s, that I think Japan maintains a uniquely sort of convoy-like banking system that is where um, the banking system is operating um, with, uh, with the government as a sort of um, quasi-public um, entity. That is, the possibility, for example, that any bank, in, a large bank in Japan would fail and not be resolved by the government is, I think, zero. But I can't think of anything more intelligent to say than that. We've got time for one more question, which we've got a question over here, please. Anita Parani, fellow. In terms of uh, short-term versus long-term returns, would you say that different countries have different views and are there political or cultural influences that affect it? Uh, yes, I think there probably are. I mean, in, uh, the, it's a very, that's a very tricky question. Um, Clearly, compensation systems are going to matter for creating incentives that are going to uh, reward short-term thinking or penalize short-term thinking so that you can solve a lot of the um, manage banking management's um, problems of excessive short-termism by modifying the compensation system. And we are doing that, at least in, in many countries, following the crisis. I think that's happening. Ownership structure is also quite important for that. Uh, and, and in the US, we actually have gone out of our way to try to limit um, concentrated ownership of banks, which I think has been counterproductive. Because what it does is very fragmented ownership tends to give management uh, sort of a clear, clear way to do just about anything it likes. So short-termism, I think, can reflect those kinds of influences, compensation, and also ownership structure, and a lot of the regulations that affect those. Okay, I think uh, we'd better stop there just, just before two o'clock. Um, thank you to all of you for, the, for, those, for those questions, and sorry for those we didn't get to. But uh, I can tell you that Charles will be signing copies of his book outside if you want to uh, pick up a copy. I'm sure he'd be happy to, uh, to uh, put his paw mark on it for you um, and uh, have, have a conversation about any other, other questions you have. Um, thank you all very much, and thank you especially to Charles. You can join me in thanking him one more time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good time.